pass by without acknowledging the um, the phenomenal um, sporting performance of Ajaz Patel um, just earlier this month, um, where he became only the, the third cricketer in the uh, history of test cricket to take all 10 wickets in a in innings it might not be um, widely known but Ajaz uh, came from Mumbai to Auckland he immigrated with his family he attended Avondale College um, and played for suburbs New, New Lynn team and played for a number of age group teams in Auckland before like a lot of other Aucklanders uh, being forced to head further south to, to get a real shot at things um, his story, Mr. Mayor, if in terms of his family and of new immigrants to New Zealand is nothing short of inspiring, leaving the cricketing side of it out, um, a real cricketing rags to riches. He, Ajaz didn't even start bowling spin bowling until he was 21. He only made his test debut at, at age 30. Um, this performance came at 33 years of age. For a while in New Zealand, there, you know, he, they, he was playing cricket and, and sneakers didn't even have um, proper cricket boots. So it's a real inspirational story um, to, you know, the immigrants that, that come to Auckland looking for a better life in the first place. But I guess from a cricketing perspective, it, it's a phenomenal achievement, especially, uh, you know, achieving it in India against the you know the best players of spin bowling in the world so i just thought it appropriate given his very close connections with auckland uh and you know this this remarkable achievement that we should should note that as a as a as a council and especially from an auckland perspective given the phenomenal growth in uh, subcontinent cricketers and uh, right across auckland now it, it, it really is a uh, a story of hope for for, for everyone that that's playing the game and also for for people who come to Auckland looking for a better lives. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor Watson. I think we'd all um, um, ag agree with those comments. It was a phenomenal performance and it took our mind off what the actual result of the game was. Um, so we we celebrated, take it, you know, first time I think any New Zealand cricketer has taken 10, 10 wickets uh, beating uh, Hadley, who took nine, I think, uh, 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 in India on one occasion. But um, yeah, great, great to acknowledge um, somebody who is uh, an Aucklander, um, a migrant to the city that's done well and now representing his new country and doing it with pride in front of his, um, his family in Mumbai. Um, probably um, the member for Franklin would also want me to mention um, Liam Lawson, um, who had his um, first trial in Formula One. Um, and did exceptionally well. So uh, he's a Pukekohe lad. So, um, yeah, there's a lot we can be proud of. Um, uh, you know, people who have come from our city and have performed uh, at international standards uh, in that way. So thank you for raising that, uh, Councillor Watson. Um, right, we'll now get into the, um, the heavy items of the agenda. Uh, and the first item is the Three Waters Economic Regulation, the Council Group submission. Uh, and uh, maybe um, uh, I'll ask um, uh, Councillor Cooper if you'd like to move this and maybe Councillor Cashmore to second it. Um, Aye. Uh, and uh, it, it's the motion is simply to approve the draft submission and authorise me to approve the final submission, which I don't expect to be much different from what we've got in front of us. Um, so could I invite um, uh, Shane Martin to uh, introduce this item, our senior economist, Shane. Double check, I've got Shane with us. Yep, yep I'm I can here, sorry. Him. Yep, Just getting everything ready to go. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I have a few slides uh, I can go through if you like. Um, That'd be great. Just to give some context and a brief overview of uh, uh, of what the submission uh, says at this point. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, the uh, so this is an issue that uh, has created some confusion in, in terms of there's the overall water services bill and the overall reform. And then there's this other piece of it around the economic and consumer protection regulation of three waters. So it's re it's obviously related to the overall three waters reform, but it's a totally separate process. Um, and so 
in theory, uh, though it hasn't been proposed that way, this is a thing that could happen even without the amalgamation of the water entities. Um, so it truly is a separate issue. Uh, a, a bit of clar clarification I want to make is uh, this, this submission and this uh, economic regulation talks about quality a lot, but that's in a different context than, so Tamata Arawai, right? That's the crown entity that regulates water quality, but it, that's really focused on the safety of drinking water. And when, when that uh, uh, entity talks about uh, quality, it's very much around like, is the water clean enough to drink? Is the water that we're um, uh, putting into the, uh, into the streams and the waterways, is that clean enough? The proposed economic and consumer protection regulator is also proposed to regulate quality, but in this context, they mean quality of service. So acceptable levels of leakage, service outages, response times, things like that. So I just wanted to, to clarify that because it did that particular issue created some confusion when we first started going through this in terms of, but I thought we had a quality regulator. So it's, it's, it's a different aspect of quality. It's around service quality. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, really the what's and the whys of economic regulation. Um, well, in my view, uh, and economic regulation is probably justified even in the absence of the water services bill, just because of the way uh, water, the three waters, all of them work, they're natural monopolies. You can't easily switch providers if you're unhappy with your service or the prices or any of the other qualities. And so, um, other things like this uh, are typically regulated. Um, the regulation that's proposed is price quality regulation. Again, keeping in mind what I said about quality, uh, what they mean by quality here. And that means capping the maximum allowable revenue of the, of the new entities subject to a set of minimum quality standards. And it would apply to drinking water, wastewater, and storm water. Um, and, and that's the, the, general overview. Uh, I'm going to, so our submission, uh, as submissions tend to be, is is quite long. I've included, uh, included it all in there. Uh, I'll take that uh, basically as read, but I do want to give you a, a brief overview of what it says um, so that, you know, you can think of you leave here with, you know, a two sentence summary um, in your head. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is a high level summary of our submission. Uh, everybody that I consulted with within the council family has had the view of, you know, economic and consumer protection regulation is welcome, but we need to be sure that the economic regulator considers all the well beings that make up economics. And you will have heard me or David Norman uh, when he was the chief economist and pretty much anybody from the chief economist unit that you talk to make this point that economics is not just about money. Um, it's about overall well-being. And so the economic regulator really needs to consider that economics is social, cultural, environmental, and financial well-being or any other well-being that you can think of. And so we've made the point that the economic regulator, though it's welcome, it, it shouldn't be operating as a de facto financial regulator, just minimum cost to provide some level of service. It needs to consider all of these different uh, types of well-being and that absolute lowest cost may not be the right answer when you do that. Um, and so that's made very strongly upfront in, in the submission. Uh, and we've also made the point that the regulator should be an independent entity and they need the necessary expertise to regulate the water industry appropriately. Now, all of these things sound kind of like, particularly that last part, a no brainer, but it's worth mentioning that um, because they propose uh, that the Commerce Commission be the regulator, they they don't have at the current time the in-house expertise around water. So if that is going to be the regulator, then they would need to bring that in. And we've just made that point. So if we go to the to the next slide, um, and this is the end of my, my summary. So this is a really high level summary of our submission. 
which is the discussion paper that they put out, which is about 90 pages. They ask 46 questions. They're all reasonable questions to ask, and we've responded to them all. Uh, many of them are uh, not that interest. I don't want to say interesting. They're, they're just questions around, if we set this up, should we do it in a way that allows us to operate effectively? And so obviously the answer is yes. Um, and they're, they're questions around the setup of the regulator, but not much about how the regu regulator will operate. And so the submission focuses a lot on, so you've asked 46 totally reasonable good questions, but there's a bunch of questions that haven't been asked and these would need to be addressed before this becomes uh, a thing that actually happens. Like, how will all the regulators work together? How will the economic regulator and Tamata ROI operate? And if there's a conflict, how is that settled? Um, what about disputes between regulators and councils, particularly around things like growth? And we have growth plan for here, but then there's a regulator that uh, determines sort of what the water entities can and can't do in terms of their their financial things. So how will that get settled? There's not a ton of detail on how stormwater would be regulated. And uh, within the council family, we've all agreed that it should be, but um, it is fundamentally different than the other two waters, just as a, a you know, kind of a brief silly example for the most case in the for the most part, drinking water comes in in a, a man-made pipe to your house from a from a treatment plant and and wastewater leaves in a man-made pipe from your house to go to a treatment plant and then it gets put out. But stormwater is is very different. The infrastructure that makes up stormwater, yes, some of it is man-made and there there are things like that, but also uh, my neighbor's piece of land that has a hill on it that points away from my house is stormwater infrastructure to me because it manages water that would otherwise come and flood my property. And so you can think of, of stormwater as being fundamentally different. So there's, there's some points in our submission around that, that uh, yes, we agree that it needs to be regulated, but it's uh, more thought needs to go into how that will actually occur. Um, and then questions around like planning and regulatory cycles being linked, how will that work? How do we, and really the most important one to me is how do we ensure that the regulator allows the new entities to trade off properly between new investment, renewals, the price of water, uh, all the other things that you can think of. So this is very much a, a, a discussion document around the, what will the setup look like, but not nearly as much about operationally how will it work. And so that's that's what the submission really focuses on is answering their 46 questions, but then making a bunch of other points of those are good questions, but you haven't addressed these. And those are really important things to address. So so I'll stop there um, just in terms of my my summary. And I, I saw there are a couple of questions, so I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Shane, and thank you for a pretty thorough job that you've done on that. Um, yeah, I think where our position has been is that we have been supporting uh, of regulation, both water quality and economic, but there's a whole lot of questions we don't know about how that second regulator is going to work. So look, we'll start with uh, questions first. Um, I have the first question in the name of Councillor Linda Cooper. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Thank you. It was just, I mean, you have answer, asked a lot of questions. Mine was, if there's a cap on the charges, How's that? Have we asked how that's determined? So, because I mean, there's huge quantums of money that needs to be spent, and if they set a cap that just doesn't allow enough money to make that happen, so I, I guess that's my question: is how do they determine that, and will it cover those for well beings, or will it just be for pipes? So that is a really good question. Um, I don't know that it's the the operationally how that will work has been addressed and that's sort of that that last point that i made in my summary which was what we need to do or what what government needs to do is ensure that the regulator is appropriately 
uh, considering all of those well-beings and that they're not just saying, what's the lowest cost that we can put these pipes in for, but what is the what is an appropriate uh, level of cost to the consumer to provide the service that is needed, and that will be all of the things that you mentioned. So I realize it's a bit of an unsatisfying answer because it hasn't really been discussed in the uh, discussion paper, but it is a thing that we've put into the submission to say, this is really important that this be addressed. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Bear, we couldn't hear you. Boss, you're muted. Bear, we still can't hey, hear you. I'm, 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 I'm back. <laughs> I, I said Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Next question. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Shane's very much on the same line as Linda Cooper's, because there's going to be a conflict at some point between the quality regulator and the financial regulator. If you take some parts of New Zealand where the consents for store, um, wastewater discharge have been 20 years um, out of date and where there's massive issues, there's going to have to be some quite strong financial inputs right at the start to actually get the required capex and opex in place to get things up to a point. So you, you pointed this out, this conflict in your paper, you didn't not sort of suggest any solutions, which I imagine they'll be desperately looking for. Um, is your any thoughts of incorporating a potential answer to some of those questions? So again, a uh, completely reasonable question. Uh, we, we haven't posed any in our submission that I recall. Um, I would say that I'm potentially not the right person to, to propose what those would be. Um, but yeah, really, how, how do we, how do we settle this? I mean, how do we settle the tension between those things? I would argue as an economist, which I, I'm not using as a bad word in this case, um, that uh, the uh, the tension between the quality regulator and the economic regulator is actually part of the point um, to create that tension and to, to really get them both to uh, operate as efficiently and do all of the things that they need to do and none of the things that they don't need to do. Um, but how that comes out in practice is going to be really important in terms of how those disputes are settled. And this is, there is a lot of talk around should the quality, water quality regulator, not service quality, and the economic regulator be in the same organization or not. And in some ways, so my view would be, as as an economist, would be no, because part of the point is that tension. Um, but from a ease of operations and an ease of getting things done, it may it may be preferable. And so they they both have ups and downsides to them in terms of figuring that out. Um, it's it's not going to be easy. Um, I know this it's kind of the the discussion paper is is what I would describe as very early days of it in terms of we know there will be disputes and they will have to be settled, but there hasn't been a lot around how that will actually happen. So I, I know a bit of an unsatisfying um, answer, but it, it's it's where where it is right now. Yeah, we're at an early up, stage. Yeah, Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Ahead, Nick, with your discussions that you're having with your panels um, tomorrow and ongoing, it would probably be an opportunity to actually emphasize that some of this, the expertise we have in Auckland in both water care and healthy waters could help resolve some of these issues and set up some test pots to uh, trial some of this uh, work out, because it's pretty essential that we got right um, very early on or it could um, unravel the whole process, but I'll leave it there. Yep, no, agree with that comment. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Richard Hills, next question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess my question, and maybe it's more about um, our comments in the workshop, um, should we be, and maybe it's more a question for the Mayor, should we be clearer or stronger about our concerns about stormwater? Like, I just really, really, you know, whatever happens with three waters, whether we um, get forced into it or not, I'm, I just... Uh, maybe Shane could answer. 
and a global sense, but also a, a, a local sense. How can we regulate stormwater in an e economic way? And and how are we going to ever charge for it? Um, and especially if it, the simple way would just to put it all back in pipes because it's a, a simple metric. It's a you know simple diameter and it's has a cost aligned to it. Uh, I'm just having a real concern that our submission isn't strong enough about our doubts about being able to regulate stormwater. Uh, you might like to have a go at that, um, uh, Shane. Um, obviously, this paper is talking about the regulation rather than the broader question of whether stormwater should be in there at all. Um, but it's a fair question to ask about, uh, you know, how how do you regulate something like stormwater, which is a, of a yeah. quite different nature? Shane, do you want to have a crack at that one? Yeah. Um, so I think the 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 council staff that I I, I sort of uh, harangued into helping me put this together, uh, they yeah. they gave um, nobody disagreed that it or nobody thought that it shouldn't be part of the regulatory regime, but everybody had sort of the concerns that you brought up. Uh, I think from from just a, a um, very simple, I guess, point of view is if you have one entity providing three services, how would you regulate only two of the services in practice? And things like... Uh, there will be costs from the entity and where do they get assigned? Do they, do they get assigned to the regulated part of the entity or the unregulated? And so it was really a, a, a practical application from that. But there are still questions that we all have around things like there will be storm stormwater infrastructure that's not provided by the new entity that's being proposed, right? So they, they'll provide plenty of stormwater infrastructure, but then there are things like, uh, you know, culverts on roads that are stormwater infrastructure and my neighbor's hill that I mentioned, which is stormwater infrastructure or streams are stormwater infrastructure in, a, in the most basic sense. And um, the way that this uh, discussion paper has, has talked about it is it will be what will be economically regulated will be the provision of stormwater infrastructure by the entity um, is how I read it, not sort of my neighbor's hill being regulated um, because how would you even do that? But it's really on just the stuff that's provided by the new entity, which again, I think to your point is creates its own issue um which is well then part of the provision of the infrastructure is regulated and part of it might not be so it's really a an issue i don't think government has totally nailed down yet um for all for all the reasons i just said i i, I wish there was a you know i could just have a one sentence answer for you and say they're doing it this way and it'll work um but i think all your concerns are the same concerns that that we all have mm -hmm. um Thanks, Shane. I guess that's a question for you then, Mia. Do we need to be a bit stronger? I just think it's a, a schmozzle. If we if we have to be pushed into this, um, yes. But it's very clear on wastewater and water supply, what goes in, what comes out, very clear on the infrastructure for that. But for me, the, the how do you charge an individual property? How do you get a business? And you and the stormwater infrastructure supplied by the entity is connected to the stormwater infrastructure that is on a property or on a road or on a park or a wetland because it's all connected. I mean, that, that's in a, mm. in a Pākehā uh, Western ideology, but also in a mana whenua, uh, mātaronga Māori kind of all water is water. So I'm just, to me, it, I wonder if we should be starting with it should, it doesn't make any sense to be in there. Uh, yeah. I did ask I, the other day, I, but the submission had already been yeah. written. <clears throat> I, I think in this submission, we're talking about um, uh, if and how it should be regulated rather than whether it should be in there. Um, uh, Craig McElroy, as I understand it, is on the technical working party on stormwater. I think that's correct, Megan. Um, but Megan, you might just have, um, do you have any comments you'd like to make in response to uh, Councillor Hills's question? 
Thank you, Mr Chair. I was really just um, offering, if you wish, given that the Mayor has just got the delegation to, to tidy this up based on comment. There's certainly comment around stormwater to your points, Councillor Hills, throughout the document. I'm wondering whether we could just have a review of that and there might be um, an additional sentence or something we can do that makes it a stronger point, but continue um, with, our, with our views and our concerns about how this could actually work throughout the report. So I'm just offering to do that as part of that final check of the, of the document. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful and would uh, address uh, Councillor Hills's question. Okay, um, next question is Councillor Daniel Newman. Um, look, thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you, Shane and Megan. Um, so with respect to economic regulation, wouldn't, wouldn't regulation apply through the prohibition of paying um, a dividend and the requirement to, you know, deliver the services at a minimum price? That would be the most basic economic regulation and the environmental regulation. I can't see how this could could be done beyond um, uh, a network discharge consent that 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 codifies the standards for which um, stormwater will be will be managed and discharged uh, as an as an activity. And beyond um, the network discharge consent, the technical standards that would be applied by the new entity uh, that would have to be met for the vesting of new infrastructure. Would, would that be a fair summation? Um, I'm not entirely certain. I think you're you're on the, I definitely think the first thing that you said is totally on track in terms of like, essentially how it'll work. It's It's a, here's what the costs are to provide this service and, you know that there's no it's not a for-profit entity so there's no dividend going to to anybody um so actually it might be useful to mention that um one of the justifications for economic regulation uh in in the discussion paper and i would agree with it which is you know the fact that these are not for profit entities is not enough to ensure i guess good economic performance and their argument would be they're not for profit now and we're doing this whole reform because of uh, inadequate performance. Now, I'm not saying I, I take that view, but that that's the that's the rationale. And so for the economic regulation, and I, I think you're you're generally right. And when I say that it needs to consider all the well-being, so things like environmental, what I mean by that is there is a um, there's going to be a trade-off that's being made of potentially like well we could put this in a pipe and that would be cheapest or we could create I'm making this up because I'm not a water expert uh, an artificial wetland um, and that will generate more benefit but mean be more expensive and so th their mandate is not to make it as low cost as possible but to trade off those costs and benefits to make uh, people as well off as possible. Um, and and so that would be the, the slight difference in why I made the point of like, why they shouldn't just be a financial regulator, but really need to be an economic regulator in, in the true sense of the word that, um, you know, the way, the way I would say it's correctly defined. Um, I don't know if that answers your, your whole question because I don't know that I have enough knowledge around like the 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 legal system for um, you know discharge, for instance, uh, of water. But um, Mayor, Mayor, if I may, um, perhaps if I could just reflect uh, for a moment back to to Megan. I think one of the central tenors of the of the council's response is that there is a timing issue. The economic regulation comes at the start, which is basically deliver the, the, the activities um, with the prohibition on a dividend and the requirement to deliver at a minimum price. The environmental regulation tends to come later because that's when you have to actually deliver the assets in compliance with the network discharge consent. The requirement is to try and get the two to talk together um, and that has to be done based on environmental effects as opposed to town and country planning. So. 
I think that the point that the officials and central government need to come to terms with is that um, it's very difficult to um, codify the need for stormwater attenuation, innovative techniques and, 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 and you know, asset design and what have you um, at a minimum price um, unless you, you know, unless you're prepared to effectively waive the requirement for minimum price because some of the most, um, some of the, some of the most innovative stormwater um, attenuation design is going to be very expensive. It might be good, but it's very, very expensive, whereas um, just piping stormwater um, to a point and then discharging it is probably cheaper if you can do it uh, high, you know, high volume pipes and etc. And I think that that point, um, Megan, needs to be needs to be reflected through you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I think it highlights the the challenge. Look, you could gold plate what you want the outcome from stormwater to be, but somebody's got to pay for it. Now, at the moment, we make that trade off um, as elected representatives. How much do we go for? Um, the quality and how much can we afford to put on um, the the consumer and the real question with the economic regulator is is how they find that balance outside of the political arena um, you know where where do you draw that line because you know I could say it's it's absolutely terrible that when it rains we still have waste going into the harbor therefore we need to invest um, uh, five six billion dollars into that immediately um, okay but then you've got to find that. And then that's the cost on the consumer and whether the consumer can afford to make it. It's not clear to me um, how they're going, how the economic regulator is going to make those trade-offs outside of political direction. Um, Megan, have you got any comment on that? Um, no, <laughs> nothing satisfying. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, the obvious question, though. I completely though. agree with all the points, and this, and I guess this is this is the point that this is early days, and we need to uh, in the submission. But although the work we'll be doing over the next couple of years um, into in through transition is exactly the kind of thing we need to influence and lead on. So I'm sorry, that's about the best I can do on that. Yeah, I, I think the thing to emphasise again, uh, as I did earlier. This is early days, it's a discussion paper, and as you get closer and closer to the point where they start to legislate for this, um, you've got to get more and more focused on how you resolve some of those critical questions, which the, the answers to which aren't obvious at the moment. Right, um, Councillor Walker, next question. Uh, sure, so I've really got a question that follows on from you, um, Mr. Mayor. It, it isn't clear in my, um, in our submission, what the relationship is between um, regulation and then what the government is proposing as far as um, accountability, responsibility and authority is in these um, reforms. And the two are intimately linked. And I think we we should be stating that. We have not stated that. So that is a question I'd put, and that is why not. The other question I've got is just around timing. If we accept that there's huge complexity in this, and that is apparent from the questions that have been put, the question ha has to be put, what level of um, economic and water quality regulation might you start with? So the question around that would be, what does a light-handed approach look like? As compared to the other end of the spectrum, where I would suggest something's being set up that is just going to dominate um, uh, effectively what happens, uh, both in respect of uh, regulation and in respect of um, delivery. And I, I guess the question that I would put to that is around what tests are being applied, especially as it goes to forecasting and backcasting against a situation where climate change is accelerating so dramatically, it's it's just not funny anymore. That means that the responsiveness as it goes to stormwater is going to be massive on the ground at a community level and at a household level. And similarly, the same thing will apply to water because water in our dams will be similarly um, affected, especially the nature of our dams um, because they are dams 
lined with trees and soil and, and the like. So I'm just raising a couple of questions there. I really don't think our submission goes anywhere near far enough to indicating the problems associated with what we've got here. Um, and I reserve my right to speak later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think if we can just take some of those points, I mean, there's been a theme coming through here, Megan, and there could be a, a way in which we we highlight the, the question of how these these matters are going to be resolved. Um, you know, we're, our submission at the moment is at a high level because we're responding to something that they, they haven't given us a lot of detail on, and it's good to highlight those problems, and I think we could strengthen the submission in that regard. So if I can leave that in your hands working with, with Shane. Um, Councillor Josephine Bartley is the next question. Josephine. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to do Wayne's ones and kind of talk, but I'm not sure where the question is in it, but I think you'll pick up the question as I'm talking, I think. Um, so I want to ask about consumer yeah. protection, consumer dispute resolution. Now, how I see it is we were the consumer disputes resolution before as the elected representatives to um, between consumers and our water services. So what is our role now? But in saying that, is there a way that the submission can reflect that the role is gone of elected representatives um, in terms of um, accountability regarding quality of service. So it'd be good if that could be incorporated somehow, because that is what I see coming out of this paper. Like, yeah, it's very, very hard. So that makes it even worse for consumers. So yeah. is that okay to be included? Yeah, I, I think I think there's a very very clear theme coming through on what our questions and comments are at this point. It's easy to regulate water quality because it's uh, it's measurable, um, and it you know and you know that it has to be the best possible quality that you can get. Um, stormwater, um, because it's you know how long is a piece of string? How far do you go in in getting to the the highest level of quality control over stormwater, and and we sort it out politically. How are they going to sort it out? I think that's that's basically what um, Daniel, Josephine, myself, Wayne, um, uh, Richard, we've all been asking that question, uh, and that is a fair question to say because this is removing political control over stormwater and putting it in the hands of a regulator and then um, you know uh, a, a water services entity without giving clear directions as to you know what the expenditure might be. We're, we're bound in terms of our level of expenditure by debt to revenue, et cetera. We have to make those trade-offs. But that doesn't mean to say this new entity with greater borrowing capacity can, can borrow to gold plate every aspect of what they've got to do. So how do they decide where the line is drawn? And none of us I, have the answer to that question, and it's a good question to ask. So I, uh, I think yeah. Megan's got that on board and will incorporate it. I think mine was more simple. Like when a resident has a problem with water, they contact us. Uh, under this new scheme, you can't see who they go to. It's not us anymore. Um, it is something else, um, which I think is a good point to make that our role has been diminished even further, but it was actually quite valuable and necessary. Um, so it's our residents or the consumer that will lose out um, yeah. My other question, if that's okay, was around, I agree with a bespoke purpose statement rather than using the Consumer Guarantees Act, because we have a lot of residents who aren't direct purchasers of water, especially housing New Zealand, you know, Kaingora. Um, so I think we're on the right track there with that um, statement. But um, my other concern was just ensuring, like, is there any way to ensure, because with electricity, you have regulation because people don't get electricity services. So it was a service of last resort. Is there an equivalent in terms of water? Do you want to have a go at that one, Megan? I'm going to leave it to Shane. Go ahead, Shane. <laughs> sure. I don't know that that has been addressed. Uh, it certainly has, wouldn't be addressed to your satisfaction in the discussion paper. Uh, it's been mentioned. There's a lot of of talk in there around 
ensuring that we take care of vulnerable consumers, but it's it's really just, I mean, it's not much more than what I just said, which is, you know, the the new regime will have to ensure that we take care of vulnerable consumers. And I think we can all agree, yes, you should do that, but there's very little on Necessity. It's not just a commodity, um, so you cannot remove the supply of water from people, um, creating both personal, family, uh, and community health uh, challenges. If you were to do that, um, precisely how they might change that from how we operate through through water care um, is, isn't clear to me at this point. It's just unfortunate that the way that consumer disputes resolution has been pitched in this. Uh, proposal is about water as a commodity because it points here that to incentivize disputes resolution they're going to do it financially you know like it's about money and that that's already taken it out of the context of water being a right and making it a commodity that's what I picked up from this proposed scheme so it is taking it into the commodity space with what yeah. they're proposing in practical terms, I, I can't see a situation evolving. I mean, almost nobody gets cut off from water at the moment. In fact, I think there may even be some legislative uh, provision to stop that happening. That's not to say that you can't find ways of putting pressure on people uh, to meet the cost of the water they're using. Um, but uh, I, I think your, point, your point's a good one, uh, Councillor, and, and we, we need to take that on board and work it out. Uh, and I'm just thinking back to your other comment, you know, at the moment somebody goes to a councillor because they know that water is related to council. So who's their political advocate when it's taken at, at, at greater length from us? Um, and the answer is, you know, probably you'd be in the same position as you were if you were making representations to somebody who had their power cut off. Uh, you can make representations, but they are not part of the council group and therefore the uh, ability to um, achieve what you're seeking through your advocacy is lessened, and that that will be a cost of the new system. Well, basically, okay. we were consumer protection before. We are no longer that. They're going to have to navigate through a whole scheme, and they may not even get, you know, their issue resolved out of this whole scheme. It's, yeah, it's relying on things that are already in place, which have nothing to do with water. It's relying on electricity. It's relying on financial services. Yep very completely different to, to water. Yep. Thank you. Uh, fair point. Um, Councillor Sayers, last question, and then we'll go to comments. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I'll pop on my video to see how stable it is. Um, uh, through you, through you, Phil, I hope this is a, it's just a slightly wider question around the, around the regulator's role than just stormwater, if it's appropriate to ask. And that's just, uh, I just had the thought uh, from the excellent questions that have been asked from the other councillors around, does the brief of his uh, responsibility or his or her responsibilities extend to regulating the sale of to offshore parties of, uh, of, our, of fresh water? Or will that fall in the scope of that regulator's role? Or do we do we know um, that or would it be would that be outside the scope? Shane, any thoughts on that? Could, could I maybe just before you start, could I just ask a clarifying question? Is that like um, water bottling? Are you talking about that kind of thing, Councillor? Yes, that's that the, right. Um, no, it's sales to the Chinese of water or whatever or who? who okay. Are. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my uh, my response to that, and Shane, please leap in if if you think there's something additional. Um, I believe that that will still form part of council's uh, role in, in water in the three waters in terms of uh, discharge uh, and taking of water. So council is still going to be a regulator and will um, give permits and or, or otherwise for the taking of water. 
So I believe that's actually will still be in council's uh, role, not not in the entities. Um, and so for the example would be um, water bottling. Um, that would be a consenting regulatory issue that councils would still retain. Shane, happy if you've got any other intel on that. I was just going to say to ask you because I didn't know the answer. So, Thanks. Okay. No, that's good. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Okay, let's come to comments. I've got two people down for comments so far. First to comment from Councillor Wayne Walker. Um, sure. Uh, got a couple of comments. Uh, my my first one is around the necessity for us to communicate as well as, he, as we can with the public. Um, in previous, um, on previous occasions when I've spoken to this, I've emphasised that we should have had a full-on campaign and it disappoints me that that is not the case because I think we've been sucked in by the um, government. They've already predetermined their uh, decisions and that's, um, as far as I'm concerned, it's an absolutely shocking way to treat a, a council and the people of, um, of Auckland. So uh, as far as uh, our submission is concerned, as far as the underlying information behind it, my recommendation is, again, that we have something on our website that's very easy for people out there to find and to comprehend because this affects them. And I can't emphasise that enough. As Josephine uh, mentioned, where they're going to go, OK? Who's going to do it? Uh, what kind of response are they going to get? How does it impact on, as Shane mentioned, the huge number of uh, people, landowners in the region that are basically dealing with stormwater, water and sewage on their own sites? Um, we just don't have any of the answers to that. But what I see is a very large top down approach that is not going to be nimble and not going to be able to adapt to the tsunami, the slow tsunami of climate change that's happening. And just in that respect, this morning's Herald, the Thwaites Glacier, 65 centimetres in a short term time frame with the potential of three metres. So this stuff is hitting us very, very soon. It impacts on water, it impacts on sewage, it impacts on stormwater and the necessity to actually push things down so that people are able to be resilient and take things on themselves. Because the big scenario, which is what we're talking here, is simply not going to deliver. We are not adequately communicating this to people ourselves as part of a campaign, and we should be. This present circumstance in terms of submissions offers that opportunity again, and we should be following through on it. So once again, I have big concerns. We're being sucked in. We need to take it full on and recognise that it's being politically driven, all from me. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. I'll close the debate just in case anybody else wanted to speak. Uh, I see. Because I moved um, it, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, you did. So you would be closing it. I see so uh, like an indication from Councillor Hills. Hills. Um, so if we take Councillor Hills, uh, and then if there are no other comments, I'll ask you to close. Thank you, Councillor. And don't say all my stuff, Councillor Hills. <laughs> uh, I, I'll try and keep it different and short. Um, yeah, it makes sense to uh, for economic regulation of our, um, our the two waters, in my opinion, and that would be regardless of whether it was uh, under the current entity or the future one, just like the water regulator and the water quality um, that we've already supported. So those those tools and those structures make sense regardless of what the future of our water looks like. Um, I guess for constructive purposes, my my main point again is just the the stormwater. I I, I just don't understand how we are meant to uh, or the new entity is supposed to charge for that. Um, I am concerned that if there is caps, that stormwater would be the first to uh, be cut out of. Uh, the situation because people always expect water supply and wastewater to be a constant, um, especially if it's coming from their house or their business. So I'm just concerned that the way we're moving, and I know that Craig and others are, you know, see good potential in this, but I still have concerns that the direction we're heading, which is, has been more in those green uh, water infrastructure, the greenways, the the fantastic um, things we've done in our parks. If you think of Hurstmere Road, the the whole point of 
we needed to upgrade Hurstmere Road um, because it was falling apart, but a huge part of that budget was healthy waters because the uh, stormwater infrastructure was not fit for purpose and was old and falling apart. Um, so I am concerned that we go into the future with a economic regulator that doesn't see um, the environmental side of our stormwater and the recreational side and all those other components that we um, and our residents expect us to now include in that infrastructure. So I I do hope, and I know that um, Megan and you have said, Mayor, that the, there will be a bit stronger wording about, um, you know, I think the first part needs to be our, our large concerns around stormwater being in. The rest, yes, there are issues there, but my main focus was stormwater. I think it is a big concern, and it doesn't sound like the agencies or the government really know exactly how that is going to be laid out from an economic sense. So water quality up there, but economically, I don't understand um, that part of this. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Councillor. Uh, and I, I'll raise that through the working group tomorrow, just using those sort of examples. Um, how do we ensure as a as a council that priority will be given to things like um, uh, Awakiri wetlands or Te Awawanga uh, or Northcote? Um, if these aren't political decisions, how are they made and who is making those decisions and who are they accountable back to? It's the core of what our concerns are. Um, Councillor Henderson, before I go to uh, Councillor um, Cooper, I'm not sure. Uh, Councillor Simpson, do you have a comment after this as well? No, uh, I'm just sort of going to, I'll leave it, Your Worship. I was just going to okay. back up Councillor Henderson. Well, Councillor Henderson, and then um, to close, Councillor Cooper, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Mayor. Look, I would like to back up Council Hills, but also um, some of the very intelligent questions uh, and comments that have come through before there as well. I think we're all kind of agreed that we need to beef up our concerns around stormwater. I mean, for me, it's even more local. It's even more of a responsibility for local government than the other two waters. Um, and just lauding the wisdom of my colleagues on this. Um, you know, I get a lot of constituency concerns around stormwater. This is an issue where people really do want to have their say and to have some form of democratic uh, control and feelings and accountability around the provision of um, stormwater in particular. And so, yeah, I think just to, to back up, I think we should be up our concerns and I think we're reasonably agreed on that. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And Linda Cooper to uh, finish, please. Thank you. And I must say, Councillor um, Walker, I did agree with your early comments. So that's something we agree on. Um, you know, the centralisation of stormwater. I mean, I agree we need some, you know, if you're having an economic regulator, it needs to be sensible, it needs to be practical, and it needs to be able to deliver not just pipes. It needs to be able to deliver community outcomes. And I think for me, I look back at, I mean, everybody will go, oh, she's talking about Waitakere again. But we, one of our biggest stormwater projects is Project Twin Streams. And it was about getting iwi, community, elected members, our staff, you know, our clever, clever staff together to find solutions. And I think this is the whole thing with having something so centralised. You lose community. You lose that um, personal responsibility that people are crying out to be part of these things. I mean, you know, if you think of Te Awanga, you think of our Opanuku and, and Oratea stream projects and all the other wetlands and the really clever, more natural solutions to dealing with stormwater, which help to restore the balance in our environment and, bi and biodiversity. Um, I just think, you know, people are really passionate about this and we are the link to that. Our local boards and elected members and our really great staff who work on the ground with all of these things and, and stormwater and wastewater an extra could be linked because if this if the wastewater doesn't work it goes in the stormwater and it goes into our hour and for me um having that taken away from us not being able to do these projects together i mean they're, they're kind of celebrations when they go well but they're also um something where everybody feels we can work together we can we can fix this together and we can make really great environments where they've often been pretty barren, often piped, you know, we're re-daylighting streams. And I'm worried that, you know, we will stop daylighting streams again and we'll just have the horrible old culverts and that kind of awful environment. We won't be able to bring the environment back into our urban areas and our suburban areas. So for me, um, I hope that, you know, we don't have stormwater in there. I don't think it's the right place. And I certainly um, agree with Councillor Bartley that, you know, when people have a problem with 
financial issues, it's quite personal. And often it needs a really careful approach from someone they feel that can advocate for them. Um, and it's quite shameful for a lot of people. People are fucking mad about this stuff. And if they feel they've got an advocate that they know, you know, it makes a big difference. So, um, you know, I'm really concerned about this whole centralisation. It feels a bit like the Politburo, you know. It's far away and it's scary. And um, so I think that I, I support having a really strong submission that supports our communities to be able to be involved in solutions rather than just paying the bill at the end and getting what they get. And it might not be a great outcome. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Cooper. And uh, we'll look at incorporating uh, the mood and, and some of those comments into the submission with uh, Shane and Megan working on that. Uh, we now have the, um, I'll put it to the vote, uh, and the vote is to approve the draft submissions with um, uh, with officials taking on board what's happened in this discussion and authorise my final approval of it. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. And I declare that carried. Um, we come now to three items um, that have been referred to us by audit and risk. Um, and I'm going to ask